On this episode of Ah, Would You Look at the Time, a docudrama about one man's quest for recognition. In the matter of it was like 30 years. It's like the case took a serious toll on his life. Deregulation bringing new changes. It wasn't like he intended to ever have this lots of oil dressing. And the return of a magical Zillow listing. I think he took it a little too far. That's my opinion. All that stuff starts right now. Look at the time. Look at the time. It's getting dark outside. We can't stop now. Look at the time. Welcome back to All Would You Look at the Time. It's me, Andrew. Allegra is here, too. Hello, I am here. We're back after a long time, per usual. Mm -hmm. But this is a special episode. I've been calling this the reunion episode, but I think it's more fitting as like an anniversary special. Uh, because this is the fifth year I've been doing this show. Oh, so it's like a birthday. It's a birthday episode. It's fifth birthday. So for this episode, I wanted to revisit a couple of old stories from past episodes. Because this year there's been actually a bunch of updates to a few things we've talked about on the show. So if you haven't listened to the show before, maybe you should go back and listen to it. Uh, because this is for the fans. The awe heads is what I'm calling them. The five people who listen to the show. There's more. I've seen the numbers. No, no. People ask me all the time for the updates. <laughs> okay. Shall we get into it then? Yeah, let's hear them. Uh, okay. So some of the stories we focused on on the show, I still have Google alerts for those topics. So you've been getting email updates on these topics for five years, basically. Yeah, more or less. Uh, but one of those Google alerts is for Stuffed Crust Pizza. So again, if you haven't listened to the Stuffed Crust Pizza episode, why don't you pause here, go back and listen to it. We're all pretty proud of it here. That was my first episode. It's true. Yeah. Uh, but to recap, we did a deep dive into the origins of Stuffed Crust Pizza, which is the pizza with cheese stuffed in the crust. And in that deep dive, we came across a man named Anthony Mangiello. I took the pizza and I bit into the crust. And I said, you know, if there was something inside here, that would be great. Anthony claimed to have invented stuffed crust pizza. And in 1987, he filed a patent for the idea, or rather the process for making stuffed crust pizza. Back then, Anthony went to Pizza Hut to try to sell them the patent for stuffed crust pizza. This was before Pizza Hut was making it at all. But Pizza Hut said no to Anthony. They weren't interested in the patent. Anthony approached them again a few years later. They declined again. And then in 1995, as we know, Pizza Hut debuts their new product, stuffed crust pizza. And I'm getting phone calls from my friends. Anthony. You sold your pizza to Pizza Hut? I said, what are you talking about? And all of a sudden, I'm finding out that Pizza Hut is launching a $45 million advertising campaign for my stuff crust pizza. This led to Anthony and his family filing a lawsuit against Pizza Hut for $1 billion because they said Pizza Hut infringed on his patent. Long story short, he loses the case, unfortunately, we actually talked to him in 2019 in our episode all about this. He calls it like a very David and Goliath story. Pizza Hut stole my American dream. There's a lot more to that episode. I still recommend you go back and listen. But there is an update to the Anthony Mangiello story. So that Google alert email I got recently, it linked to an article about a short documentary being shown at the Long Island International Film Expo called Stolen Dough. Hello, Pizza Hut. I'm a product inventor based in Brooklyn, New York, and I have a huge opportunity for you. My product makes them eat the crust. Anybody. According to the press release, the film is about, quote, a young Italian-American chef who, at age of 18, invented and patented stuffed crust pizza. This patent was stolen by Pizza Hut, and what follows are the real-life events of a $1 billion lawsuit. This was never supposed to be this way. This was supposed to be a moment of pride for the whole family. I gave them the patent and then they stole my idea. What did Bob do? He fight back. Obviously, this is about Anthony. So when I heard about this, I was like, oh, we need to go see this movie. 
right? 100%. So Stolen Dough is a documentary. It's about 45 minutes long. It's directed by Stefano De Frey and produced by Laura Pellegrini. They received the Russo Brothers AGBO Film Grant, which funds films that specifically explore the Italian-American experience. Notably, the Russo Brothers from, like, the Avengers movie. Giving back that Avengers money to the people. Yeah. Uh, Well, according to the director, Stefano, his Italian background was helpful in getting this movie made. I think it helped a lot being Italian to understand sort of what it meant to him as an Italian-American, the story, the the patent that he invented, and who was going to feel like they really understood the process as much as they possibly could, you know, because you're going back in time at this point now, 40 years almost, when the patent first gets approved. It's a, it's a tough thing. And that clip is from our interview with Stefano DeFray. That's right. Allegra, you and I were able to interview the director of Stolen Dough to talk about the process for making the movie, working with Anthony the Big Cheese Mangello, and of course, the origins of Stuffed Crust Pizza. Did you have fun in this interview? I did. I did not know where it was going to go, but it was really a really interesting combo. Yeah. So let's hear the rest of the interview. Can you give us a sense of sort of like the timeline, like how and when did you first even hear about Anthony's story to the point where you had this movie idea that you wanted to make and were getting it funded? Like what was sort of the trajectory in the timeline for that? So I remember the exact date. It was December 3rd, 2021. We share a publicist, Anthony and I, and my publicist had called me, actually emailed me formally to send to me a deck, a story, a pitch of not so much photos, but archival material and a whole story about this. I knew that this was going around in that winter. I talked only to my publicist at that time. I did not talk to Anthony until I want to say end of January. So a month and a half later, like the end end of January. I then met him in early February. And I knew when I first met him that I wanted to start shooting in April Our first day of production was April 21st, 2022. It was the first day we started shooting the film. It was the first day at work. So how was he involved? Was this something like he was trying to get a documentary made about this story? Oh, my God. Anthony would have wanted to tell the whole world. I mean, a documentary, a show, multiple podcasts, multiple events. I mean, it's something that hurt him tremendously. And I could tell in the early meetings of setting this up with him how much pain it caused him. It didn't matter that it was like 40 years. It didn't matter that it was like 30 years. It's like the case took a serious toll on his life and it it burnt him badly. He felt really, really, really burnt. So I could tell all of that in the beginning. And so this idea of having a film and someone portray him and I didn't necessarily make the film as a as a documentary per se there was a more of a docudrama and that was part of the conversation that i had with the russo brothers that it was not they don't normally take documentaries and so some of the scenes were more dramatic interpretations of them and mm-hmm. they had, there had to be a script written for them and and that was fundamental so i think anthony's desire to tell his story was just straight out out the bat but myself and laura and the whole team of people wanted to create something that was had a dramatic aspect to it and it was just not all point and shoot not all documentary not all talking heads you know what about the story specifically was interesting to you like obviously andrew has told you we talked to anthony before you know we're familiar with how charismatic he is so in talking to him he is just like an interesting and fun figure but what about the story and the other parts of it the legal aspects what was exciting to you about that did, did, okay, okay. When I will answer the question, but did Anthony bring up one uncut ring? He's like, how could they produce <laughs> one uncut ring? Yeah, There's yeah. no way you can produce one uncut <laughs> ring. I've been in the cheese business all my life. <laughs> Show me one uncut ring. I have never seen one uncut ring of cheese. That's Anthony's number one go-to thing. I mean, sometimes we would be in meetings for two hours but the first hour would just be about one uncut ring and i'm like okay anthony 
I get like I, I get it. Like I'm about to pass out. Like I got it. We got like, I, I under, like I got it. But to his credit, and this goes back to Allegra's point, I know the patent like front to back. And it is not easy to read a legal patent. The language is very technical. So it's not an enjoyable read, but it's extremely nuanced. And so that part was challenging. And so I knew what Anthony was trying to say in his behavior is that, is Stefano the right director to take this project on? Will he take the time, not just as a filmmaker, but will he take the time to go through the process of the patent to understand it as much as I do so he can do a thorough job in telling the story authentically, right? With Allegra's point, what was the part that really stood out for me that I knew I wanted to make this film? I think his age, how young he was, that he got the patent, that it was sent in. His father was in cheese manufacturing. All of that is true. His father literally invented, had the machine that invented the polio string cheese. So that's really, uh, it just messes with your mind because your father's product is being used in to make the placements of the, of the cheeses. <laughs> yeah, so, but I think the age... The fact that I was still so curious emotionally about how he couldn't let it go, it still really, really bothered him. That interested me on a personal level. And then how he was taken advantage of also, not just how young he was, but how amazing it was that he took on a corporation based on saying, no, this is not right. And I don't care how powerful Pepsi is, I'm doing this completely out of integrity. So Anthony gets pretty emotional in the film. What was it like working with him and like reliving these very tough moments for him? First time I screened him a rough cut before I was going to color the film was privately in October of 2022. It was after I just sent it out to the Russo brothers. So I had something for him. I was in Florida with my wife and he says, why don't you come over? I said, you know, I, I have a cut of the film. It's very rough very rough. He goes, uh, it's okay. I said, I feel awkward showing its use. It's not, not in great shape. You know, the color's off, the sound is, it's not mixed. He goes, no, nah, no, nah, I want to see it. So I'm expecting just, you know, two people to be there. He has a lawyer over. Oh, wow. <laughs> he invites me over with a tequila, talking about other projects, other more products that he wants to do, more, more <laughs> cheese products, expand the business. His wife is there, so I, I know Monica, so I say hi to Monica, of course. He's got friends from the neighborhood in West Palm Beach. <laughs> they're, they're coming over. So I'm like, now we got screening here. After about an hour of eating some cheeses and some food <laughs> and then drinking tequila, I screen the film in his bar. And the television is like a 40-inch TV in a bar. <laughs> and we're all sitting on bar stools watching this movie. And I, I turn to him, you know, and I hear something and I, I think he's like, he's like, oh, oh like, oh God. Like, 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 I'm expecting it like to be like, oh God, this kid, what the fuck has he done? And then, <laughs> and, but instead I just see him crying. He's sobbing. And that's the most important moment that I had as a director. I realized the impact right there. He's with his wife who's holding his hand and he's sobbing. Like I, I put my arm around him and I was like, I must have said something like, I hope they're tears of joy rather than tears of pain. It's going to look a lot better than this, you know? <laughs> and he's like, you did a great job. He's like, oh my God, you did such a great job. And I, I really, that was the most important moment when I shared him a very, very rough cut for him. So he is elated with the content. He loves the film. He honestly says to me, pulls me aside and always says, you know, it's better than I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that was a big sticking point between me and Anthony was Anthony wanted to sit in on the interviews. He wanted to sit in on everybody that I was going to be there because he felt it was his story and, and he wanted to know what they were going to say very understandably. And I said, listen, you know, I, you got to trust me on this process. This is not my first rodeo. I did, I did a film for about sexual abuse from a woman's shelter in New York City. You cannot, people will freeze. They will say different answers if you're there. If they know that you're there, they will not talk. Right. They will not say the things that may, you may want them to say in the end that will make a better film if you're there. You have to trust me not to be in the room. Just that process of really him and I seeing each other, you know, trusting each other, that took a lot of time. 
I mean, a lot, like months. But now he goes, I get it. I really get it. Something interesting about this story for me is like, it's kind of funny, right? Right. Like the kind of seriousness of the truth behind stuffed crust pizza. But also this is like, he was really affected by this and it is really emotional for him. So how do you kind of balance that or respect that, you know? Well, I think that's the response that a lot of audiences have. Or I, I mean, I know when I came home and I told my wife, she's like, it's funny, right? Like, it's about pizza. Like, how yeah. serious could this be? Like, it's about pizza. And I think what I do is I let it be. I let it unfold the way that it's it's supposed to unfold. I mean, the first five minutes of, of screening it with an audience at a theater when we were we were in lower Manhattan, you can have the audience start laughing in the beginning. They'll start laughing in the first two, three minutes and then they start to get quiet and quiet and they start to see a film of corporate greed and David versus Goliath. Mm -hmm. And so my job is to show with the archival material of the depositions from the lawyers of how badly he's treated and how they tell him, you know, to shut up and don't let him answer his, they, they never let him answer any questions and they basically mm -hmm. berate him. You see him sort of breaking down. You see him mentally breaking down in the archival material. I'm trying to push the audience slowly and it doesn't happen overnight. It just happens, you know, gradually, you know, in the five to six, seven, by the 13th mark, you're sort of hopefully in there where you get into the realizing that this person has their entire life at stake. It's costing them a lot of money. They're emotionally breaking down. And then by the time where, I don't want to give away the film, but at the time where you see the car scene, where he's sort of at the end of his rope, you realize the consequences of that. When you start looking at the money and the revenue that Stuff Crust Pizza had and the impact that it had in the mid-90s, the late 90s, the early 2000s to Pizza Hut and how much revenue it was bringing in, then it's not so funny, right? It's not so funny that they start expanding their business and then they don't want to give him, and then they give him an offer. You see the offer in the film. I'm not going to say what scene. It's one of my favorite scenes of all time in that, in that movie. But they basically give him an offer to go away and it's all corroborated. And that's how I handle it. You know, I listen, if people start watching and they start laughing in the beginning, that's okay. I just know that by minute seven, you're not going to be laughing. I try to make the film look more like, you know, an Oliver Stone film, a film that has a lot more darkness and, and some drama and it's more moody. And I hope that comes across because it's not by accident. You know, I want to create yeah. that moodiness in the film so you feel more connected to, to his suffering. Yeah. Other than people obviously like making that pivot from finding the premise sort of inherently funny to understanding the particulars being very serious, what do you sort of hope is the ultimate takeaway that people have? Is it to kind of radicalize them to be like Team Anthony, you know, get your dough, haha. What what do you think that you want people to walk away from the film feeling and wanting for Anthony? I think for Anthony, the most important thing would be a corporate acknowledgement that, you know, the person who invented, who was credited, incorrectly credited as the inventor of stuffed crust pizza was a food scientist. And it's not her fault. Her name was Patty Shabmeyer. And she was a food scientist who was just doing her job. But she was not a chef. She wasn't an inventor. She was a, a chemist, a lab scientist, who was looking at, already looking at patents that had been sent into Pizza Hut, that they had already had. And a corporate acknowledgement, at this point, Anthony doesn't need the money. For Maggio Cheese's, his company is, is doing extremely, extremely well worldwide. But this idea that he got there first and yeah. gave it to them, and they acknowledged that they got it, and they had it for so long, it eats away at him. It eats away at him. And I think a corporate acknowledgement, even if they said he was part of the instrumental patents that they were looking at, which we know from their filings from Patty's, because Patty has to say in the deposition, in the summary judgment with the court, with Judge Nickerson, she has to as well comment on the case. Mm -hmm. So if you, if, you know, this is Paul public records. If you want to look at the Mongello's versus Pizza Hut, you can see that Patty Shabmire, Shabmire has to actually comment on the, the summary judgment so that the judge can come up with a, a summary judgment of trying to assess this case. I, I think also 
Anthony wants the public's support. He feels cheated not having a trial by jury. He could not believe that this was mm -hmm. not settled in a court that some judge, that Judge Nickerson, had the right to basically shut him down. That's the second thing. And the third thing, and this is all my sleuthing, when I'm preparing to send this out by September 1st to the Russo brothers, I'm going through microfiches and I'm going through old pieces of documents and I'm looking at the Manhattan Disciplinary Committee of District Court Judges. And I start coming across the judge. I said, let me just put in, let me just type in Judge Nickerson. And I start seeing other cases of inventors that have the exact same theme and the exact same pattern of summary judged not being able to have a trial by jury. And they're the same corporate versus individual cases of patent inventions. And I could not believe my eyes when I came across this. I mean, it was like a mind blowing situation. And for those who are listening who haven't seen the film, it's the I would consider it the second to last scene in the movie when they talk about the summary judgment. And the fact that there were claims of corruption from the judge himself for cases exactly like Anthony was like a button, like just a, a button to that end point. And I felt just vindicated on that sleuthing just for myself. Anthony couldn't believe that. He didn't even know. That's the thing. Like, I, you know, this came about last summer when I had gone through all of the findings of that right here, right here at home in New York. Stefano, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. This is really fun. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Stolen Dough is still hitting up the film festivals in the U.S., but Stefano says the movie will be coming to streaming soon. Also, make sure you stay for the after credit scene in Russo Brothers fashion. Oh, wow. Look at the time. We're going to be late for a meeting. Okay, so here's another story we want to update everyone on. The French dressing regulation. Again, if you haven't listened to that episode, you should go back and give it a play. It's a lot more interesting than that sounds. <laughs> uh, well, here's a quick summary for anyone who forgot. Allegra, we found out that specifically French salad dressing was regulated by the FDA. Like there is a specific definition or standard of identity for salad dressing, and then a more specific one for French dressing. Long story short, it's because vinaigrettes used to be called French dressings, and the regulation is so old that the market got confused. Because of this outdated regulation, the Association for Dressings and Sauces were lobbying to deregulate French dressing so there can be more innovation and salad dressings in the market. And you remember, Allegra, we were wondering if that regulation was hurting salad dressing companies or if this lobbying was just like some kind of money making scheme. I don't know. Yeah. Lobbyists. But we actually found this one salad dressing company called Mullins. They're based in Illinois, a little small town called Palestine. It actually has a regionally famous French dressing that it's forced to call imitation French dressing because it falls short of the FDA standards of identity. They say, well, it doesn't matter. It looks like a French dressing, but it doesn't have enough oil in it. So you have to use the word imitation. So it's an imitation French dressing. That's, that is Mr. Mullen's original salad dressing that he made. Allegra, you and I, we talked to Jeff Shaner, who was running the company at the time in that episode we did in 2019. He told us that the name imitation French dressing has confused so many people over time, they had to make an FDA-compliant French dressing alongside the imitation French dressing. People come through here and want to taste it, and I'll explain to the difference uh, what it is. And I say, well, would you like to try the imitation French or the French? Oh, give me the real stuff. You know, even though the imitation French has less fat in it, so it's, it's better for you. But uh, people just have that word imitation in their mind. And so, yeah, over the years, yeah, it's, it's hurt us quite a bit, I'm sure. So we should have updated you sooner. But finally, after decades of the Association for Dressings and Sauces pushing for French dressing deregulation, it finally happened 
in February of 2022. You may have heard about this in a recent episode of Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. Just know, anytime I'm talking about something else, 90% of my brain is still focused on the Association for Dressings and Sauces. <laughs> my new favorite trade group asked them to do something about the definition of French dressing back in, and this is true, 1998. <laughs> And when they announced the decision, they didn't even explain why it took them more than two decades, spanning 1-9-11 and the dissolution of the Spice Girls, to arrive at that decision. At the time, the Federal Register stated that the French dressing standard, quote, no longer promotes honest and fair dealing in the interest of consumers, end quote, and that removing the standard of identity, quote, will provide a greater flexibility in the product's manufacturer, consistent with comparable non-standardized foods available in the marketplace. So this is actually good news for Mullins. The thing is, since then, Mullins hasn't actually changed the labeling on their French dressing, and they continue to do business with the imitation label on the bottle. So they still sell French dressing and imitation French dressing. Yeah, but things are changing at the J.D. Mullen Company. They have new owners. According to the Mullins website, Jeff Shainer transferred the secret recipe of the French dressing over to local resident Penny Shaw, who bought the company this past summer and is now running the business. Uh, here's a little article that I found on Rob Law News. The Shainers appreciate the opportunity to have been in service for many years to the township of Palestine, Jeff Shainer said. We're thrilled to have Penny Shaw continue the strong legacy of Mullins. Shaw plans to continue making dressing according to the old recipes. However, she anticipates some modernization will be required to take them through the next 75 years. I just want to say here, not long after Penny Shaw took over Mullins, Jeff Shaner, who we talked to um, in 2018, he passed away, sadly. Very difficult moment for the company, right as this new era under this third generation of ownership. We were in touch with Mullins shortly after the new ownership was announced to have Penny on the show and talk about how everything was going. And uh, Penny was very gracious with her time. We got to talk about all that. And if there are any new plans to update the products now that French dressing has been deregulated. We really enjoyed that conversation, so let's go and share it here. Penny Shaw, welcome. Thanks for chatting with us. Oh, thanks for inviting me. Can you tell us how you got involved with Mullins? Why did, how did you get involved with the company? So my story is a bit of a strange one. My husband and I actually own an aerospace business just south of Palestine. And we have about 100 employees for that business. And I heard that Mullins was for sale back in about March. And at the time, I was like, oh, dear, we have to make sure that doesn't leave Palestine. Because Palestine's an old town. It's actually the oldest town in Illinois. Mm. And unfortunately, like a lot of small towns, it, it has, well, it's dying, right? And we don't want it to die. And Mullins is a huge piece of that history. It's a huge part of the town's economic viability. So I was like, I think we need to do something about this. So I went and I actually talked to Jeff. I um, took a tour of the building with him and we discussed all kinds of different things. And it was just a couple of weeks later, I think, maybe it was even a week later, that we had a terrible tornado hit this area. Oh. And it actually wiped out our entire airport. Every building on the airport, every airplane on the airport was gone. And my whole focus changed to that because we lost an airplane and my husband was on, he's on the airport board. So, you know, <laughs> that took priority. And so I got kind of busy with the tornado. And so it was about in July, I thought, okay, I wonder what's happening with Mullins. I wonder what's happened. Like I knew it would be a really big project to take on. And very quickly, I just realized this was something that we should do. I wanted to make sure that it didn't leave Palestine. So I met with Jeff and we pretty much made a deal very quickly. And it wasn't really too long after I purchased it that he actually passed away. He'd been sick for some time, quietly sick, I would say. It wasn't like lots of people knew. And 
he he went downhill very fast, unfortunately. So. Oh wow. Yeah. So obviously, being a citizen of the town, having this your husband having a family history, I imagine you had some relationship to Mullins, but I'm curious what the community response to the fact that, you know, it was for sale or what place it has there. Yeah, I don't think that very many people knew it was for sale. I would say that. If you live in this area, I've lived here for just over 20 years, I guess. I'm actually Australian. Um, So I moved from Australia to California, where my husband was doing airspace projects out in California. Um. I did my time in the Mojave Desert. (laughs) You know, then we followed a program to to Denver, and then we were back here on the family farm. But yeah, it's been crazy. (laughs) So how long has it been since you took over Mullins? Um, this is week eight, I believe. Oh, okay. So yeah, pretty, pretty fresh. What What have you learned so far? What's uh, How's it been going? Well, I've never really bought a business before. We've usually just started them. So that's kind of got its own challenges, but it's going really well. I mean, he's got a really good group of staff members that they know how to make the dressing and all that kind of thing. So that's been good. And what we're in the process of doing, as you can imagine, there's 75 years. Mullins has been on Main Street Palestine for 75 years. So the building is full of treasures. So we've been sorting through treasures. And of course, some of it needs to go, to go back to Jeff's family. And we're actually in the process of preparing for a big renovation. Wow. As I see it, it's kind of got to the end of its life cycle. Like the building has been there for a long time, of course, and the equipment's been there probably some of it since 1948. Wow. So we are in the process of basically shutting down production for a few weeks so that we can get all new equipment and, yeah, renovate the building quite substantially, actually. Yeah. It'll be totally fresh and new. Speaking of new things, so... Originally, when we first talked to Jeff, we went on a deep rabbit hole of why French dressing was specifically regulated. Did you know about all this before well, <laughs> before Mullins? It's actually interesting. I did talk to Jeff about that back in March when I was talking to him about possibly buying it then. He said, this is going to be something if you do end up buying Mullins that you're going to have to think about how you're going to deal with this. And I was like, all right, what's the deal? And so he explained to me, you know, the original Mullins, like what John D. Mullins had made originally was this imitation, like it's the green bottle, right? Everybody knows it as imitation green. That's what they know it as now because the FDA required it to be called imitation. But of course, John said, well, we're going to have to have a real French dressing. So he's got it in a blue container. So there's Mm -hmm. the green and the blue right? You can imagine. And so the thing is, everybody wants the imitation, the green bottle. I mean, when you go to restaurants around here and ask for dressing, like it's on the menus around here. Like you go to the pizza place. I want, (laughs) I want Mullins. All of the restaurants buy green. And I think that there is a lot of confusion with the blue because my guess is that People get to the supermarket and go, oh, I want the real one, so I'll get the blue. Yeah. So I think that a lot of it is accidental purchase in that way because they're not really, they don't really know why is it called imitation. So I, I don't know. We've we've obviously talked about this a lot. Like, what are we going to do about this? Yeah. And I guess where I'm leaning towards right now is calling it the original John Mullins original French dressing aka imitation keep the label green mm. and see how that looks in five years <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah get people used to the concept of it making a slight subtle change like that so is that because of the deregulation now you're able to kind of shake it up a little bit for sure or will you still have the regular blue then well i think we'd have to for a little bit but it's a matter of how we would market that a little bit. Like, I almost want to say with extra oil, because <laughs> sure, yeah. I want to turn people kind of away from it in a way, because I would just prefer to have green. That was his intention, right? Yeah. It wasn't like he intended to ever have this lots of oil blue dressing. 
really, I think that long term, I would like to take the blue completely away. And then it's just, here's the original. I just, people are very, it, it's hard to change quickly when you've got yeah. <laughs> almost a cult following here. But I've only talked to one person in the last eight weeks that prefers the blue over the green. Cause I'm obviously trying to find out the data myself. Like what do the people want? And I've only heard one guy say, well, I love the blue better than the green. So I'm like, <laughs> okay. We, we actually just did um, like a food samples and things like that. And as soon as you explain to people the difference, I, I will say to them, you know, do you understand the difference? And as soon as you do, they're like, oh, I want the green. Um. So it's yeah. an education thing, I think. Yeah. How expansive is, is the distribution of Mullins? Well, that's a really good question. Um, we, I'm still trying to figure that out exactly, but <laughs> you got to understand, I can't ask Jeff all these questions. So yeah, I'm right. trying to figure it out, some, some of it myself. I know that we met with a, a grocery distributor just yesterday, and we're in 400 of their stores, basically. Mm. And it's all Illinois- Indiana, Tennessee, Ohio, this kind of the six states around here. Mm -hmm. But I also, I know that we ship it to Pennsylvania. There's some supermarkets out there and West Virginia, and I think down into Florida. So it's kind of here, there and everywhere. And of course we have a website. So people are buying it online every day, getting it shipped all over the country. Are you keeping the other dressings too? Yeah, there's some other ones. So there's the creamy Italian and there's a special, which is kind of like a honey mustard. And then there's like the two, like a barbecue sauce and then the apricot ham glaze is what they call it. Yeah. I think that we we might switch to maybe doing some of those like seasonally as opposed to just having them on hand. But I just don't have enough data yet. Yeah. I, I just don't know. We're about to completely upgrade all the equipment. So once we can make more of it and throw some more sales and marketing at this, I think there's a good chance that the sales on those products might go up too. So we'll right. see. In the press release, there was a press release you guys put out and you yeah. had mentioned that there were some modernizations that were in need. I imagine one of those being the French dressing, but are there other like products or things that you've identified that you are like, oh, I really want to update this, or I've seen other companies have done this and we don't. I think a lot of that reference to modernization is literally about the building and the equipment. Mm -hmm. When we're dealing with bottling equipment that's from 1948 or something like that, we want to move. I mean, when it works, it's great. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's gorgeous. And it's very heartwarming. But when it doesn't work, it won't, it's, it's painful. And so I honestly had no idea how, pro I mean, I watch how it's made. So I've seen kind of sure, yeah. mechanization of like big product lines and all that kind of stuff. But you can't go to Walmart to buy that. <laughs> so <laughs> I started looking around online and somebody said, come see us at Pack Expo. And I was like, what's Pack Expo? It turns out it's like this big trade show for packaging and bottling and all of that stuff in Las Vegas. Uh -huh. And they have 3 million square foot of machinery ready to sell you. And I was like, I need to go there and go shopping. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's, that's what exactly did. what I did. I went to Vegas last week. I took a couple of like an engineer and technicians and we went out there and we went shopping to find like a better system that will work a lot better. So is that the priority at the moment, as opposed to sort of working with the team to come up with new flavors and products? Yeah, that, that's definitely, we, we have to have the ability to make it. And once we've got all of that, we'll be able to kind of go into different areas. I think one of the first things I'd like to do is to add an, like an organic non-GMO type line. It's very close to that. So it wouldn't wouldn't take very much effort at all to just get that little butterfly on it and be non-GMO. Um, <laughs> right, yeah. And I think that there's a, a large segment of the market that would appreciate that. That's probably one of the first things I'll do. The other thing that we're finding as we're going through all the treasures is all these different recipes. I mean, it was not limited to these six items at all. 
He had a Thousand Island um, ranch. Mm. We even found a label for Russian dressing the other day. I'm like, what is Russian dressing? (laughs) So, I mean, I think we have all kinds of options. I mean, this guy, John Mullins, he was a chef. And so he actually started having all these restaurants. And so there's all kinds of recipes that we can kind of use. And I don't know. There's all kinds of possibilities here. It's very exciting. Could do the Mullins historical line. It could be yes. fun. Yeah. I know. So it, as part of the renovations, we're planning to have kind of a museum area. So we'll have some of the old equipment so you can see it. <laughs> we won't use oh, it, that's awesome. but you can yeah. see it. And uh, we'll kind of do like a video of the history and that kind of thing. So people, I mean, it's a really neat story. I love that. I really this do. Very cool. It's neat. Well, I wish you best of luck to everything. Thank you. Keep us updated on uh, on the new labels and all that. I'm very interested. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> it's, it's such a challenge. It's like learning a new language and everything, but it's great fun. I'm enjoying every minute. Okay, one more update here. This is a sore subject for both of us, I think. Maybe for different reasons, but I would agree. (laughs) Listeners of the show may remember the episode about that old house with a church on the property that I wanted to buy in 2020. An old house about 100 years old, a quaint bed and breakfast outside of Pittsburgh. The listing read, Living room has wood burning fireplace. There are three guest rooms on the second floor. The Olympus room sleeps four and has gas fireplace. The Egyptian room and the Jacobian room each sleep two. All rooms have exquisite decor to their themes and includes rare and historic items. The walk-up partially finished attic has lots of options. Most all of contents stay for turnkey operation. The second building, the old church, has lots of use, potential events, or even a shop. Allegra, you didn't care for any of this stuff, huh? I think you took it a little too far. <laughs> that's my that's my opinion, looking back. Yeah, to keep it short. So the update for this episode is that the house was, I guess, technically off the market, as far as I knew, not too long after I made that episode. Uh, at least it wasn't online at all. But earlier this year, that old house was back on the market at an even more affordable price. And then I became re-obsessed with the church house. I was like ready to go back and go buy it. Do you remember this time? Not one of my favorite times. (laughs) So this was back in March. I was like ready to buy this house again. Like I went through the whole like trying to get a mortgage and all that. And then me and my dad went over to Pittsburgh to go and look at this house again. And this time we stayed at the house. Take a radio. Oh, yeah. This is it. Yeah. Holy cow, jeez. It's a pretty good sized church, huh? Jeez. You've arrived. Destination is on your left. So actually I was keeping a diary at the time. It says I was so nervous on the way there. Did I want it anymore? Once we got in, it was more beautiful than I remember. <laughs> Which it was. It was looked like a museum, this house. Uh, an old, over 100 years old, I think the house was. It was so cold today. It snowed a bit. And this was weird. When I was there, there was a picture on the wall of Leechburg. 87 years ago exactly to <laughs> the, when I was looking at the photo. Oh, wow. And I was like... Is this a sign? Like, this has to be a sign. I hung out for a bit and dropped my dad off at church. (laughs) My dad wanted to go to church. But not the church attached to the house. Not the church attached to the house. A different church. Then I drove to New Kensington to check out a record store called Preserving Underground, which was inside of a church. (laughs) 
<laughs> There's a lot of churches in wow. the area. Uh, it was also a concert venue, and that uh, the Cro-Mags happened to be playing that evening, which are, is a New York-based band, actually, New York City-based band. There were some weird coincidences <laughs> when I was there that weekend. That night, me and my dad went out to dinner at this nice little restaurant that was in a repurposed old hotel. Uh, I was like imagining myself like going to these different spots in the area, like if I lived there. It was really immersive and like a really great way to like introduce myself to the area. And it just got in my head like, oh, this is where I'll go Friday night if I live here, you know? When we were leaving, I was like, all right. I'm going to put in an offer when I get home. So this it took like almost six and a half hours to get there from Brooklyn. So the six and a half hours on the way back, I was just like thinking about my life in Leechburg and near Pittsburgh. And I was like going on my phone and looking at cat sitters in the area already. <laughs> in I was Leechburg? Like, yeah, I was like convinced that I was going to get this house and that it was going to happen. And then that night, once I finally got home, I emailed the realtor and said, here's my offer. And he immediately texted me back and said, sorry, the owner accepted another offer. And that was the day that like, I came back. Yeah. So you literally had been there that morning. Right. And then when you got home that same day. Yeah. Yeah. And I was devastated. <laughs> I was so sad. I was so sad that I stopped writing in my diary for the rest of the year. <laughs> and so this was a really sad time for like a couple months for me. It seems like a little privilege to say, but just like I built this all up in my head and it was like immediately was not happening anymore. So I missed another chance to buy that house. You, you were pretty happy about that though, right? I was upset that you were upset. Yeah. But I was also upset that you had been so gung-ho about embarking upon this plan that did not include me for many reasons, but also that it was not my dream or anything that spoke to me or was relevant to my life or would make me happy. So it felt very much like a single-minded quest. Yeah. Which I ha also have to respect, though, because you are your own person. So it was upsetting to me because, in a way, it was closing a door to, like, any life that would involve me. Because I had no interest in having that weird house that I did not particularly like in my life. Yeah. Uh, well, you dodged a bullet there, I think. I was not happy to see you so sad, but it was... I was happy that this meant we could have new hyperfixations in the realm of strange houses. So I think that's mostly it for the updates. The big ones. There's been some other stuff. Yeah, like I've seen Lou the Hippo from the Hippo Saga episodes. Um, he was doing all right. Still don't know how old he is. We had a party in honor of the Watergate. We did. We had a Watergate party. It was pretty fun. That was a great time. Those are both references to other previous episodes that we did not discuss, but are worth re-listening to or listening to for the first time. Definitely. So we're going to wrap this up, but I think in the future we'll have a lot more coming. I think I want to do more video things this year, this coming year. So look out for that. I have Go. a couple surprises in the works here. I'm launching a GoFundMe for the hair and makeup budget that me being on video will require. <laughs> and till then, I guess we'll see you soon. And always reach out at awylatt.com and you can email us at andrew at awwouldyoulookatthetime.com <laughs> and then if you want to email Allegra I'll just forward her that email it's a good idea okay I'll talk to y'all later bye bye <laughs>